Hello everyone! In computer graphics we need two pieces of data, triangles and textures. We had a look at triangles in the last episode, so today we'll discuss textures. The first thing I want to have a look at is how we represent color on a computer. If we take this light green color, or any color for that matter, then we can represent it as how much red, green and blue goes into that color. We do it using a number between 0 and 1 for both the red, green and blue components. In this case, our light green color is made out of 0 0.57 red, 0 0.82 green and 0 0.31 blue. We write all of this information together as a three-dimensional point, or I'll sometimes also write it as a three-dimensional vector. I already used this notation in last week's video when I was talking about colors as vertex attributes. Now that we know how we represent a color, we can look at textures. A texture is nothing more than a bunch of colors arranged in a grid, and I'll make that grid a bit more obvious here. We can assign an index in the horizontal direction as well as the vertical direction, and this texture has a width and height of 8. Each of these grid squares is called a texel or texture element, and they can be indexed using the numbers I wrote next to our texture. So for example, this texel I highlighted in blue has a horizontal index of 3 and a vertical index of 1, which in further formulas I'll write as t subscript 3, 1, and that is equal to this three-dimensional vector which contains the red, green and blue components of that color. This is just an 8 by 8 texture and therefore doesn't contain too much detail. However, if we increase the amount of texels that make up this texture, then the image that the texture is supposed to represent will become crystal clear. Now that we know what a texture is, we'll move on to UV mapping. Given this 3D model, in this case a cube, and this texture, in this case an image of the six sides of a dice, UV mapping is a technique that allows us to stick that image onto the 3D model. In this case that will give us a dice. The way this works is by defining a coordinate system around our texture. The top left corner of the texture will have coordinates 0, and the bottom right corner will have coordinates 1. We call the horizontal axis the U axis and the vertical axis the V axis, which is where the name UV mapping comes from. To now map the texture onto our cube, all we have to do is define a UV coordinate for every vertex that makes up the cube. For example, these front four vertices can get mapped onto the UV coordinate system like so. We now store these UV coordinates as vertex attributes of the corresponding vertex. If you're paying close attention, you might notice that there are vertices, like this one, that can map to multiple different points on the UV coordinate system. The way we solve that is by adding two vertices into the vertex buffer. They will share the same position, but will have a different UV coordinate. Since vertex attributes get interpolated across a triangle surface, we can determine the color of any point on our 3D model. Let's say we have this point, then the computer can tell us what its UV coordinates are, and now all that's left to do is figure out what the color beneath that point is. Unfortunately, that is not as easy as it sounds. To do it, we use something called a sampler, and you can just think of it as a function which takes in a U and a V coordinate and outputs a color. It can do that based on a procedural function or based on a texture, which is what we will look at. The first thing we'll have to address about samplers is addressing pun intended. Given this texture, I've drawn a UV coordinate system around it. If we now map a polygon onto the UV coordinate system like so, then you'll see that we have a slight problem, since it's not contained within the 0 to 1 range. This is very useful, but it begs the question which color we should assign to points outside of that 0 to 1 range. For example, this point. One way to solve it is to just assign a color to every point outside of the 0 to 1 range, for example, black. 
However, that's not very satisfying. Instead, it would be much nicer if we can somehow map every point outside of the 0 to 1 range back into the 0 to 1 range. And we do that using an addressing function. The easiest one is probably the clamp function, which given an input x returns 0 if x is smaller than 0, returns 1 if x is larger than 1, and returns x in every other case. The idea behind a addressing function is that we calculate its result twice, once for the u coordinate and once for the v coordinate. So in this case, if we calculate it for 0 0.5, it returns 0 0.5, and if we calculate it for 1.25, it returns 1, since 1.25 was bigger than 1, and then the addressing function returned 1. These two values now form a new UV coordinate for this point. In other words, the color of our original point should be the same as the color that's beneath this new point. To visualize this, we can draw the color for every single point outside of the 0 to 1 range. And by using the clamp function, that would look like this. There's a bunch of other addressing functions, for example, the repeat function, which just repeats the image at every integer junction. You'll see that it is made out of a function frac, and frac is defined as the absolute value of x minus the absolute value of x rounded downwards. All that frac does is that it returns the fractional part of a number. For example, frac of negative 2.5 returns 0.5. The repeat function is now defined as 1 minus the fractional part of x if x is less than 0, and the fractional part of x in every other case. We also have the mirror function, which mirrors the texture at every integer junction, and it is defined as the fractional part of x if x rounded downwards is an even number, and 1 minus the fractional part of x if x rounded downwards is an odd number. Finally, we have the mirror once addressing function, which mirrors the texture around the origin of the UV coordinate system and then becomes a clamp function outside of it. It is defined as 1 if the absolute value of x is larger than 1 and the absolute value of x in every other case. Now that we know how to assign colors to UV coordinates outside of the 0 to 1 range, it's time to discuss filtering, which is the process that will actually assign the color to a UV coordinate. Coordinate. Filtering mainly evolves around interpolation, and the easiest form of interpolation is probably linear interpolation. If we take two colors, for example blue and green, and we name them A and B, then you should imagine a line between A and B that is numbered from 0 at point A to 1 at point B. Given any value between 0 and 1, linear interpolation will gradually change the value from A to the value of B. As with pretty much every concept in this video, you can think of linear interpolation as a function which takes in two values, A and B, and a third value, T, which ranges from 0 to 1. If we represent colors A and B as two vectors, then we can calculate the color of, let's say, this point at 0 0.5. We just fill in these values in our linear interpolation function and then use basic vector math to calculate that the resulting color will be this one. Whenever you see me use the capital letter L further down this video, you should know that it represents the linear interpolation function. Let's now try to answer the question that we've been trying to answer for quite a while, and that is given this texture, how do we know what color this point should get assigned? To answer it, let me zoom in on those texels, and the first thing you should know about texels is that they are not really colored squares, instead they are just points which have a color assigned. That also means that if we want to know what color we should assign to the white dot, that it should be somewhere in between the color of these four texels. The easiest way to assign a color to our white dot is just by assigning the color of the texel that is closest to it. So in this case, that would be the bottom right texel. We refer to this method as nearest neighbor filtering, but it might result in artifacts 
So a better way to determine the color of this white dot would be to interpolate between the colors of these four texels. One technique we can use is bilinear interpolation. To do that we first linearly interpolate between these top two texels. We then linearly interpolate between the bottom two texels. And finally, we can linearly interpolate between the two colors we just calculated to get to this final color. Once again, this method is referred to as bilinear interpolation since we linearly interpolate twice, once horizontally and once vertically. Now that we know how the concept works, let's talk about the math. All we know is the UV coordinate of the point of which we want to know the color. However, the UV coordinates range from 0 to 1, and that is not useful, because the only way in which we can look up a color in a texture is by giving it a precise index. We therefore have to map the UV coordinates from the 0 to 1 range to a range that ranges from 0 to however many pixels there's in the texture's width or height. We'll call these coordinates x and y, and x is calculated as the u coordinate put through the addressing function and multiplied with the width of our texture. Similarly, y is equal to the v coordinate put through our addressing function and then multiplied with the texture's height. In this case, the x and y coordinate happen to be equal to 5.66. The next thing we have to do is figure out the colors of these four texels, and we can do it using these four formulas. These formulas look up a color in the texture. They do it by rounding the x and y coordinates up or down, depending on the texel we want to know the color of. If we round x and y up or down, then we get this result. So C0 will be the color of the texel at index 5 and 5. The next thing we need are two values to linearly interpolate between these four texels. We'll call these values A and B. We calculate A and B by taking the fractional part of X and Y. And in this case, the result of that fractional part of X and Y happens to be equal to 0.66 for both A and B. Given all these values, we can finally write the function for our sampler. This function will first linearly interpolate between C0 and C1, as well as C2 and C3, based on the value A, and it will then linearly interpolate the result of these two interpolations using the value B. For completeness, the function for the nearest neighbor sampler just returns the texel's color at index X and Y rounded towards the nearest integer, in this case 6 and 6. Finally, there is one last thing I wanted to discuss, and that is MIP mapping. Let's say we have this 8x8 texture and we have to display it on an object that only takes up 2x2 texels. You might have expected that 2x2 texture to turn out a bit more blue. The reason why it doesn't turn out to be more blue is because it was sampled using bilinear interpolation, which only took into account these four regions of four pixels. As you can see, the blue pixels weren't sampled and therefore the resulting 2x2 texture won't show that blue color. To fix that problem, you'll have to take into consideration these four 4x4 four four blocks, and then the final 2x2 two two texture will turn out a bit more blue. The question is, of course, how do we sample these larger regions? Let's say that we have this 128 by 128 texture, then we can generate a MIP map chain for it, which contains images that are always four times smaller than the previous one. This is also the reason why textures usually are squares and have a width and height that is a power of two, since it allows you to go all the way down to a small one by one texture. The way this MIP map chain works is that every four textures Pixels in one texture make up one texel in the next texture. We of course do this using bilinear interpolation. As I already said, each texture in the mipmap chain is four times smaller than the previous image. This means that the area of the first image in the mipmap chain is one fourth of the original image, the next one is one sixteenth of the area of the original image, the next one is one sixty fourth 
of the area of the original image, and so on. As a complete side note, the sum of this row of numbers is equal to one third. This result was already used by Archimedes more than 2000 years ago. The only reason why it's useful for us is because now we know that MIP mapping will take up one third more memory. Now the question is of course, how do we use MIP mapping? Let's say that we have this 5x5 texture and we want to sample this point. We now take the MIP map that is smaller than our 5x5 texture and the one that is larger than our 5x5 texture. For people who are really into mathematics, the way we figure out that we need the 4x4 and the 8x8 texture is using these formulas. I'll leave it as an exercise to you to figure out why that is. So back to our point. We'll sample our two MIP maps using billion neuron interpolation at the same point as the point in our 5x5 texture. This will give us two colors which might look the same but are actually different. All that's now left to do is to linearly interpolate between these two colors. And that is why this method of figuring out a color is called trilinear interpolation since you first perform bilinear interpolation in the two MIP maps and then linearly interpolate their results together. The only question that remains though is where on that line we should take our sample. In other words, what is the T parameter for our linear interpolation? As it turns out, we can take our linear interpolation function and rewrite it to get an expression for T. We'll now say that A and B are 4 and 8 and L, which was the result of a linear interpolation, is going to be equal to 5. We can fill that in in the formula, and now T is going to be a value that you could use to linearly interpolate between 4 and 8 and get 5 as a result. In this case, T is equal to 0 0.25, and now we know that we can linearly interpolate between these two colors at this point, which can now be used as the color for the point in our 5x5 texture. That was all I wanted to cover in this video. If you enjoyed this series, then consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash floatymonkey. And with that being said, I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.